Hi, I'm Dr. Michelle Kittleson, a heart failure transplant cardiologist and professor of medicine at the Smith Heart Institute at Cedar sinai in Los Angeles, California. While I wasn't lucky enough to attend AHA 2024 in Chicago in person, I was lucky enough to be able to absorb the excitement from many clinical trials, and I'll highlight three here that either will or may in the future change my practice. So first up, we have to talk about the SUMMIT trial. So it's fair to say that incretin-based therapies are having a moment in cardiology. Incretin-based therapies are a class of medications initially developed to manage type 2 diabetes. They enhance glucose control by mimicking or amplifying the action of incretin hormones, which are released by the gut in response to food intake. Two key incretin hormones are glucagon-like peptide 1, GLP-1, and glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptide, GIP. In addition to improve diabetic control, these agents also promote effective weight loss. So the initial trials assessed the effect of these agents on patients with diabetes, then diabetes with cardiovascular disease risk, and diabetes with established cardiovascular disease. Overall, it was very clear these agents reduced weight as well as the risk of a composite of cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, and stroke in patients with diabetes, elevated cardiovascular risk, or established cardiovascular disease. Now, the benefits of these incretin-based therapies have extended beyond diabetes in several trials. First, we have semaglutide, a GLP-1 receptor agonist. In the SELECT trial, in patients with cardiovascular disease and BMI over 27 and without diabetes required for study entry, semaglutide was associated with significant weight loss as well as a reduction in the composite of cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, and stroke, a huge win for these agents extending their benefit to patients without diabetes. So these agents reduce cardiovascular disease in patients regardless of diabetes, what about in patients with heart failure? So that's where the landscape changes, and I'm laying the frame for the excitement of the SUMMIT trial. But the this was first tested in the step hefpef trial. In patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, semaglutide resulted in improvement in symptoms, physical limitations, exercise function, and the magnitude of benefit was related to the extent of weight loss. So the question at that moment was, is it all weight loss or is there something special about these incretin-based therapies in HFPEF? So the SUMMIT trial, an AHA late breaker, answered this question and enrolled 731 patients with HFPEF and BMI over 30, median BMI 38.3. Trizepatide, which is a dual agonist, both GLP-1 and GIP, reduced the risk of cardiovascular death and worsening heart failure by 38%, an exciting observation that may extend the role of these agents to patients with heart failure. So currently, semaglutide is approved for patients with type 2 diabetes, and both semaglutide and trizepatide are approved in the United States for patients with a body mass index above 30 or body mass index greater than 27 with a weight-related condition such as hypertension, dyslipidemia, type 2 diabetes, obstructive sleep apnea, cardiovascular disease. It remains to be seen if, based on the results of the SUMMIT trial, there will be an extended approval to those patients with HFPEF. So next up, let's talk about a trial that is not quite ready for prime time, but I believe it sets the stage for future opportunities in the world of cardio-oncology. Let's talk about the SARA trial, effects of secubigil vasartan on prevention of cardiotoxicity in high-risk patients undergoing anthracycline chemotherapy. This was also an AHA late breaker. In the SARA trial, 114 patients undergoing chemotherapy treatment with anthracyclines, that is doxorubicin or donorubicin, for breast cancer, lymphoma, sarcoma, or leukemia, who had an elevated troponin during anthracycline treatment, 
were randomized to sucubitril valsartan versus placebo. The primary endpoint was the incidence of patients exhibiting a greater than 50% reduction in global longitudinal strain of the left ventricle after six months. Now, this is exciting because this primary endpoint occurred in 7% of patients receiving the ARNI compared to 25% of patients in the placebo group. So the ARNI group improved their global longitudinal strain, whereas the placebo group experienced a decline in global longitudinal strain. The EF was essentially stable in those in the ARNI group, decreased by 3% by MRI in the control group. So this is the first trial to demonstrate the cardioprotective potential of ARNI in high-risk patients receiving anthracycline chemotherapy. Ventricular dysfunction, as assessed by reductions in left ventricular global longitudinal strain, were significantly lower in patients receiving ARNI than in those on placebo. So the authors should be congratulated for this randomized controlled trial, as these are sorely lacking in cardio-oncology. Limitations include that the study didn't examine factors like survival, quality of life, which is what we really care about. The study also took place at a single hospital in Brazil, so it's unclear how generalizable these findings will be. It's not clear that it will change practice at this time. But I think when we look back years from now, when we hopefully have a large armamentarium of clinical trial evidence to guide the care of patients in the cardio-oncology sphere, we'll look back at this trial as early evidence and potential of benefit. Finally, I'm going to talk about the Realize K trial, another AHA late breaker. We all know how important mineral or corticoid antagonist use is in patients with HEFREF. Based on multiple randomized controlled trials, MRAs receive a strong class 1 indication from both the AHA, ACC, HFSA, and ESC heart failure guidelines. However, we also know that MRA use is hampered by hyperkalemia. So in this context, the Realize K trial randomized patients with MRA-induced hyperkalemia to sodium zirconium silosilicate, that's S. CSZC versus placebo for six months. Patients who received this potassium binder were four times more likely to achieve normal kalemia on doses of spironolactone 25 milligrams daily or more without the need for rescue therapy for hyperkalemia. So this should be good news, right? We know the potassium binders work, but now in the particular subset of patients with HEFRA, who've demonstrated intolerance to an MRA with hyperkalemia, there was an open label run-in to identify this subset, we now are able to see that these patients can accept, achieve acceptable normokalemia and tolerate the use of the MRA. Is this cause for celebration? Well, it's always important to look at the soundbite as well as the fine print. And the fine print of the Realize K trial is that more patients who received this potassium binder, SCC, had an adjudicated heart failure event over the course of follow-up. Now, some patients with heart failure may be susceptible to fluid overload when exposed to SCC, given that it may result in increased sodium absorption. So we have to balance, as clinicians, the potential benefit of this potassium binder as allowing more patients to tolerate MRAs with the potential harm of promoting fluid retention. I show this to you, I explain this to you, because I think the Realize K trial is an important lesson that a clinical trial may serve to answer one question, efficacy of this potassium binder in reduction of, sodium, of potassium in patients who receive MRAs, but may open up other avenues of investigation. What are the overall clinical benefits and safety of this intervention? So bottom line, should patients with HEFREF with hyperkalemia from MRAs receive SZC to facilitate MRA benefit? 
I don't know, think we know for sure right now. And like most things in medicine, it comes down to judgment and experience weighing the potential benefit on an individualized patient benefit. What is their volume status? What is their future risk of volume overload and decompensation? And having a low threshold to withdraw the agent if there's evidence of congestion after initiation. Okay, so there you have it. The Summit Trial, the SARA Trial, and the Realize K Trial. Again, I'm a heart failure transplant cardiologist, so I'm naturally drawn to the implications of heart failure studies that either will change or may change my practice in the future. But I hope you found this quick, deep dive into three trials useful with insights to potentially change your clinical practice. Thanks so much for listening.